everybody knows Orca Media is here um, because they're here for the board meeting anyway, and they asked if they could come to, to tape this too, which works out wonderful for us. So it will be connected to the board, me board meeting pieces, although not technically a board meeting. It looks like we have lots of our board meetings here. I'm going to apologize if there's a squeak in the background. That is my dog who picks the good time to play with his favorite toy. Um, so we're here to talk about uh, this ESSER funding. Let me present here. Um, so, so I can give the community a sense of what's happening, what we know, what are our guidelines around We're here this, to talk significant guidelines, and then just to brainstorm a little bit. It looks like we have about 25 people right now, so that's a really good group. And I have a Google Doc um, that I will let's see here. Actually, let me put that in the chat. Ah first before we do anything. Sorry, just want to put that in the chat first. Copy link, let's go back to Zoom. also in the slideshow but I wasn't thinking it's at the end of the slideshow so that's a that's a Google Doc with just some opening questions and and as we're going feel free to use that as like the community brainstorming document um, so feel free to to it's meant for you all so write in it and I'll use that we use the same process with our staff um, a, a week ago so um, please, there's guiding questions in there, but those are just that. They're guiding questions. They're not necessarily ones you have to abide by. Um, so please put other ideas and links or whatever you need into that document because uh, we're going to use those to do some triangulation of data. Um, so let me go back to the presentation. And Anna, maybe if you, if people keep coming in, maybe if you could keep putting that link in the chat so people can see it. Um, Cause I know that when, if people weren't in in the beginning when I put that in the chat, they may not see it, that'd be great. Okay, so let's get back here. So I have a very quick presentation and then we can talk um, a little bit more about this money. Uh, so this is all about the ESSER funding uh, community forum and what that money is all about. So. The state has put out, as you've probably heard, if you've read anything about this or followed any of the press conferences, what they call a recovery plan. Um, I put recovery in quotes because I don't think we need to recover a lot. I see this as how do we move forward and how do we innovate for a different school district, perhaps. I don't want to recover what we had. I want to think forward from that. And I think recovery is a very detrimental and defeatist kind of term. So I'd rather have a much more optimistic route. So. So many of you have talked to me about this and I always put recovery in quotes and that's why I, I think we could have come up with a better name than that. But that's what the Agency of Education is calling this. Um, and there is a link. I have, Anna will share this presentation. Um, we can share it on our uh, website so that you can see that link, but you can also just, I took those words right from the AOE website. So if you Google Vermont's education recovery, you'll get the documents and all the guidance that we've gotten. It's all up for public use on the, on the AOE's website. But their recovery plan is split into three different buckets. Uh, the first being social emotional health, mental health and well-being. And the quote there you see is straight from the guidance. So it's basically an idea of how is the AOE defining these things? Um, because in certain places they define these terms very differently than uh, we would define them in the district. This one is pretty right on those students internalizing and externalizing challenges both inside and outside the classroom as well as nutrition, physical health and family functioning. And then the second bucket is student engagement and truancy, um, where it's all students are fully engaged in learning and academic progress, regardless of the extent to which they experience remote or in person learning. This is the piece that uh, has a bit of difference between school districts and the AOE. The, when the Agency of Education primarily talks about this budget of student engagement and truancy, they're talking about attendance. And that's pretty much their line in the sand. I think of many other things when I think of student engagement, uh, but the Agency of Education seems to be defining this primarily as attendance. 
And then academic achievement and of success, of course, identifying the extent to which any students have fallen behind, as well as identifying students who have excelled. Um, I will just uh, to Main Street Middle School's horn a little bit. We had our data day today at Main Street Middle School, which was phenomenal. And, and their data does not show that there's a whole lot of falling behind of students. Um, so that's phenomenal work that they're doing over there that is fresh in my head. Uh, so there are buckets. So when we, we now have what's called ESSER money. Oop, I'm missing some E's there. Grant will point that out to me. Sorry, it's the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. So we've gotten thus far um, a lot of different federal fundings. First, it came in the, in the form of the CARES Act, and that was, that was right away emergency funding. So when we had to buy tons of PPE, tons of cleaning materials, um, thermometers, everything that we have purchased for the health and safety of our startup this year, we were able to get much of it reimbursed by CARES funds. We also put up a, um, a lot of money for childcare and worked with our, our after school program part two to provide more childcare. And we, we paid for that out of, of CARES money. So that was kind of the first round. The second round was ESSER one money, which was not significant and had a very short turnaround time, which we used to buy um, computers. We used to buy Chromebooks and we used to to restock and really look at Main Street Middle School libraries, which our data is telling us that Main Street Middle School classroom libraries needed some reboots. Um, so we spent a lot of money on, on classroom text for Main Street, Main Street Middle School. Um, ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, though, are quite significant in terms of the amounts that we're receiving. In ESSER 2, the application is open now. So we know more about ESSER 2 than we know about ESSER 3. I was in meetings for about four hours today around these two sources, um, so I was talking about it for a lot today. ESSER 2 is approximately $935,000 coming to our district. The application is due in November of 15, uh, November 15, 2021, but we can only use this money through 2023. It's an end date, a very clear end date. Um, for how for how long this money is available to us to use. Um, so it's non recurring. It's considering emergency aid, which is important. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. Some examples that's from the Agency of Education guidance. We could use this money for Messer 2 for construction and renovation, but that construction and renovation has to be directly linked to the recovery plan. And remember, the recovery plan is those three buckets. It's social emotional behavior learning, it's student engagement and truancy, and it's academic growth. Um, so if we have construction with ESSER 2, it has to be directly linked to one of those three buckets. So we could pur purchase instructional materials with it, we could pay for professional development, we could acquire property, which I thought was funny is one of the examples the Agency of Education uses for, for this, but some, for some school district that might be a reality. For ESSER 3, we know less about ESSER 3. We know how much we're going to get. We're going to get 2.2 million. Um, we have to use this money by 2024, September 30th, 2024. This is also non-recurring emergency aid, so it will not be there forever, just through September 30th, 2024. There's a caveat that 20% that is mandated to address learning loss, so that equals about $440,000. We haven't received much more guidance than that. The Agency of Education is expecting the guidance to look very similar to ESSER 2 with a few little caveats like the 20% piece. Um, and the Agency of Education, because of the, the amount of ESSER 3 money across the state, they're expecting a lot of construction and renovation projects that they are tying to health and safety. Um, but other than that, it's very similar to ESSER 2 money. So the decision-making process on how this is a, quite a lot of money, <laughs> as everybody knows, and it's an opportunity for all of the districts across Vermont, including Montpelier Roxbury, and that's how we're viewing this. How can we take this uh, money and use it to our advantage um, the most? And so when we're thinking about our decision-making process, just at, in a very general stage right now we're in the brainstorming phase and we're looking for input from a variety of people we've had we've talked with staff we continue to talk with staff we started the conversation with the community tonight obviously we've talked a lot about this in the leadership 
ranks and we've started talking to our external partners, particularly part two, the after school programming, because I have a hunch the AOE has alluded but hasn't put it in writing yet that they will be looking for us to use some of this money for after school programming and, and daycare for students and childcare for students because the state has put a huge push on that and, and is promising a lot, this is their vehicle to do that. So I believe that there will be a big push for after school. So I was on a phone call with Jeff O'Hara, who runs part two just the other day to talk about some different ideas and, and open up that conversation with him. Once we have lots of different input from, from a variety of people, we'll triangulate that input. What are the themes that keep coming up? Um, and we'll synthesize that all together. Uh, and we'll start to combine that data, that information into, into the themes that we start seeing based also in the recovery plan. So, so how do those themes connect to our recovery plan that we have to connect these dollars to? And then we'll prioritize. We'll reach out to experts in respective fields and within our staff for feedback on any planning we have. We'll start begin, and Grant actually has started to do this already, attach real dollar amounts to ideas so that we just know what ballpark we're in with our ideas, and then make some decision. Our goal is to have the application for ESSER 2, because ESSER 3 isn't open yet, but for ESSER 2, the $935,000, to the Agency of Education prior to June 30th, 2021, so that that opens up the funds. We know that that money is not, um, is not a, or it doesn't have to be in until November 15th. However, if we're thinking about summer programming, if we're thinking about anything that we want to have happen start, starting at the start of school year next year, we have to get those funds approved prior to that time. Um, so that we can have it in place um, and so that we can do our due diligence this spring and summer to get things in place. So we're really looking to move our deadline up into how to into applying for ESSER 2. Um, ESSER 3, we have some more time with. There are some parameters that when we think about using one-time money that we have to think twice about. So when we're thinking about one-time money, we really wanna think twice about putting any type of new position or using this money to pay for any kind of new position because the money for the position will only be available for two years. So unless there's an end date for the work of that position, um, we really need to be cognizant that we are, at the end of two years, we either have to move it to our local budgets or we have to riff that position. We have to get rid of that position, which is always hard to do once you have somebody really good in that role. Um, so, so we have to be really cognizant about any type of position that we think about here. Construction projects, any kind of construction or renovation, they have to fit within federal parameters. So be, the feds have put these parameters onto us, onto us around the recovery planning. The Agency of Education has as well. So any type of construction project has to fit into one of those buckets. And that we have to go through a significant approval process in order to get our construction projects approved. We have to go through about three or four rounds of approval with the Agency of Education in order to get construction projects approved. So that's going to be significant and it's something we're definitely working on because we will be doing some construction with this money. Um, however, it's just it's something that we have to think about. They have to fit in the buckets. Uh, consumer so or computer software, we want to think about that with any re kind of recurring expenses that's significant because we'll have to pay for it once, if we still want it, we have to pay for it once the money is gone through our local budgeting process. And then ideas, um, only the uh, with the Agency of Education, ideas that have a very strong evidence base for um, success in those three buckets for the recovery plan will be accepted. Uh, so we really want to be thinking strategically about how we can address the, the, the buckets that the Agency of Education has asked us to address um, through this funding. So those are really the parameters that we have, that we've considered as we're thinking about using these monumental funds that are coming towards us. Um, so on this Google Doc, you'll see these types of questions. Uh, what types of summer programming is needed for our students? What innovative programming might we want to think about for our students that we need startup funds for? Where are the gaping holes in programming that became more apparent throughout this pandemic or before the pandemic? 
Uh, what significant renovations or construction could be considered for health and safety? What ventilation projects do we need? What heating and heating and cooling projects do we need? Uh, that kind of thing. And where are upgrades to our properties needed that can fit into one of the recovery plan um, buckets? So those are the questions I put on that Google Doc and there's the brainstorming doc. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see you all. Um, and the chat is open too. So if anybody wanted to, we can open this up to conversation. It looks like there's not many people. We got 29 people on the call here. So, and I think two of them are ORCA. So we can um, open this up to conversation. If you wanna use the raise hand feature, which is if you go into participants, let's see, Jim Murphy, you're the king at this for, for board meetings. It's in. So if you go to, uh, the, if you hit the oh, participants link, a little um, column comes on the right hand of your screen. Um, and down at the bottom, there's a little raise hand button next to invite and mute me. Yeah, there you go. And Jim, did you want to add on any comments about, uh, I kind of just went off for that, for just the parameters and some de definitions of what we are looking at. Did you want to add anything to that? Um, not much. I mean, I think you did a fantastic job of, of kind of laying out what I think is really unique and, and wonderful opportunity. Uh, and I also just want to say that, you know, one of the reasons I think we can be creative and forward looking with these funds is because of what a fantastic job the administration did of, of managing our assets during this pandemic. I mean, I think we are really in, in good shape. Um, and in a position where you know this this can be additive rather than where I think some districts are, which is in a true you know recovery mode. Um, so I just want to you know thank the administration for all the hard work they've done to to put us here, uh, and then also say that you know in, in kind of addition to the parameters that Libby put on, I think you know really thinking about uh, you know the community and the district's values and what we can do to to promote those and to. Um, you know, do some things that will will kind of take us to the next level on on advancing some of those those values and um, priorities as a community. So, uh, I think other than that, um, you know, nothing to add. And thanks for the, the the well put together presentation. All right, so you can put questions in the chat, or you can use your raise hand feature. I see Cassie. Was that you? I'm going to miss this. Is there a recovery team for MRPS? The Vermont After School sold you out there. Um, we do have a recovery team. I'm, I, again, put that in quotes. So the, the re, we were at, told to form a recovery team within a week to have it in. Now we have teams, we have guiding leader, we have guiding coalitions in every one of our buildings, which are leadership teams composed of teachers, IAs, and principal, and assistant principal. And we also have our district wide leadership team. So we were told to put together a team without knowing any information. We didn't have the guidance as to what we were supposed to use the team for. Um, and we had a week. So we just put in our leadership team as our, as our technical recovery team. Um, and as it turns out, as we got more guidance-ish from the state around recovery plans, what the state did, and I, I, I appreciate them for doing this is that they followed the same planning as the continuous improvement planning that we're mandated to do with our federal fundings that we have we do all year long. Um, and so that's what they've asked us to to basically submit is our continuous improvement plan over again. So while I recognize that it sounds like from the press conferences and things that this is a grand, you know, a grand new team um, and very large scale what they've asked us to resubmit is our continuous improvement plan. Um, and the only change that we've had to meet, because your continuous improvement plan have to address SEBL and academic growth, um, the only piece that was additive to that was the truancy piece um, and how, would, how we would address the truancy piece and, and absenteeism, um, which quite honestly, we haven't had, we've had a bit of, but it is not anywhere near some of my colleagues. It's, it's not a tremendous, our absenteeism and truancy is not much greater than what it is on a typical year. What are your plans to hear more widely from community? So this, so we're trying to put out for the community to, to get in touch with us um, about different ideas that they might have through this type of work. 
um, once we have a lot of different ideas, we can, we're going to work on, work on reaching out to people in the community to say, hey, what do you think about these, um, to get some more feedback on it. Yeah, and I'd also add, you know, the, the board um, has public comment at the beginning of each session, um, you know, uh, that's, I mean, in addition to other organized forums, that's another opportunity to, you know, to plug into the first few minutes of the, the board meeting and, and weigh in. So. Yeah. And I know that our principals also have, at least UES and MSMS have parent groups that they meet with often. Yeah, and, and you know, um, email as well, like dropping ideas to the administration, copying the board, all, all good ways, all good ways to weigh in and, and we will definitely, you know, do more reach out as well. Julia, you have your hand up, go for it. Yeah, so um, in regards to that, I just want to put a plug in for um, doing specific outreach to marginalized communities, um, to BIPOC families, to families with students with disabilities, families with um, LGBTQ students, because I think, you know, it's good to sort of cast the wide net and make and and open open up for the feedback. But what we're learning, I think, over and over again, is that we really need to specifically make an extra effort to hear from folks and we know just from all the things we know <laughs> about how our how our uh, country works and how our culture works and how our local uh, situation works that um, it's uh, there are th when there are gaps in anything it, they are more likely to affect the more marginalized uh, folks in our communities. Um, the other thing I just want to put a plug in for tonight is I am really concerned as a as a mental health provider, really concerned about the. Um, the system, the existing resources that we have in place for students um, and for, for, for children, for everybody, actually. Um, and I'll just say, um, uh, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a uh, solely a school problem. It has to do with the whole ecosystem um, of mental health resources, but that, that will definitely impact our students and our families. And um, I would really love to see, I, I, I just, just sort of by way of pointing that of saying what's going on. I um, have been in private practice in this town for six years. And um, I've always, it's always been a little bit hard to make referrals. It's always a little bit hard to find spots for people. Um, but all of a sudden right now, I am getting multiple calls a week for intake requests. And not only am I full, but everyone I typically refer to is full. Even the practices where it's like, I know they're gonna have a spot are full. Um, and I just spoke the other day with somebody who runs a practice like that. It's a group practice. There's multiple clinicians there. And she said she's trying to hire more clinicians to try and meet the need and can't find people. So um, I know, Libby, that I've heard you say publicly that you're, you know, on Vermont Edition, that, that mental health um, resources are not an issue in our district. But um, I do think that very much, um, I, and, and I think that the mental health <laughs> um, folks that we have on board, the social workers, the guidance counselors are amazing. Um, and I think their plates are already too full and they're gonna get more full as we, as we, the community is less able to support kids outside of school. I would really love to see um, a position, a short term, <laughs> a, a, like a, a contracted, you know, two year position um, to have somebody really work on strengthening the network um, of mental health supports in our, um, both informal and formal. Um, and I think one example of that is the is the referral network that that has cost nothing. It's been free <laughs> um, that we've created to refer to help to support the school staff in referring um, matching kids with open spots. Um, I think there need to be creative solutions like that. And unless somebody's you know funded to uh, unless there's somebody whose whose job it is to do that, it's really hard to go beyond little projects here and there. But I mean, I think there are peers. You know, family peer support type things that could get put in place. I think there's kid peer support things that could get put in place, um, or even just creative ideas like that referral network that would really uh, take advantage of the amount of caring and um, and sort of community spirit that we have if we could really harness that and organize it. Yeah, great. So I would I would encourage you to put down real specifics on that Google Doc or on a separate. Google Doc and make sure you email it to me and if you have a proposal and a plan. Absolutely. Bridget, go ahead. 
Okay. Hi, my friend. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, before I start with some thoughts about this, I do just want to um, say a big thanks to you personally, Libby, and to every single person that works in this district for how successful this year has been um, under incredible circumstances. So thanks. Um, hey, on, on the funding issue, my recollection was that before um, pandemic hit that you and the leadership team were working very hard on rolling out district-wide efforts aimed at equity and at curriculum development across the district. So I just wanted to put in a pitch for using some of this funding to get that work back off the ground that was interrupted by the pandemic. Um, and I know hiring additional staff long-term is not the greatest use of one-time funds, but surely adding some support for you and Mike Berry and the principals to do some of that work, the K-12 science curriculum, the health curriculum is something that um, could be done on a you know two-year basis instead of forever. So that was the pitch that I wanted to make, um, particularly on the science side and whether that could be combined with maker spaces and lab development on the construction side, that would be awesome. That's it. We got, the, we got those ideas. We actually stay tuned for the board meeting on May 5th. If that, I think that's the right date, the first March, May board meeting, because we're going to talk continuous improvement um, that and, and the plan that Mike has put in place for curriculum direct development in particular is uh, is well, it's, it's going to be well established. Yeah. So so pay attention that that board meeting. Great. Thanks. But you brought up one thing that made me think today. Andrew Grant and I, Andrew LaRosa, our director of buildings and grounds, Grant Geisler, our business manager, myself, after a meeting with the Agency of Education today um, and other superintendents across the state around this, we're bringing up, you know, Main Street Middle School. We had that board committee and we have lots of data around Main Street Middle School and the needs there. Um, and can some of this help solve some of those challenges that we have there with that building? We're spending a little bit of time particularly in, in terms of the kitchen and the and the cafeteria and eating space and do we have enough room there for kids and is there a way to redesign that space so we have more room for cooking and and kids um and also the playground and also the science labs those were the biggies that came up during that committee meeting so that data that we have already collected from community and from teachers over in you know that particular building we're we have that in front of us as one of the data sources that we're using to as we as we think as we brainstorm right now. Cassie, do you have your hand up or is that from before? Yeah. Um hi, how's everybody doing? Um happy beautiful Wednesday afternoon. Um I will enter some ideas into the Google Doc. Um lots of thoughts around after school and summer um and lots of supports that my organization can provide. So I, that there's, there's a lot of opportunities in there. Um, and something else I've been thinking about is around outdoor education and outdoor learning and how, um, how can the money be used to support that moving forward? Um, and I'm thinking of this through the new ES lens because my daughter is in first grade and she loves eco so much, but I'm just trying to, I don't have an answer here, but I'm just like, how can that money be, how can we put money towards that to make it um, even more awesome than it already is? And it already is really awesome. But I know we don't have space for outdoor classrooms, but what is it that we, that we, that teachers or um, students need for more outdoor learning? Is it, um, is it curriculum that can be written and is ready to go for them? Is it other supplies? Um, um, I was just talking with a friend who does the um, kind of consults and does about 10 hours a week at Wadesfield Elementary School um, on their outdoor education program. And I was like, this is just such a great opportunity because there is evidence there. I mean, it's like, and, and it touches on the mental health. Um, it supports learning. It helps our students recover. Um, so I, I think you make it fits in perfectly to me with some of these goals and um, I'll just have to be think a little more creatively about like what specifically or maybe this is a really good, good ask for teachers like what would they need um, 
yeah, to meet, to, to like take ego to the next level. But I will, I'm, I've got lots yeah. of others that I'm not going to say right now. And, I'm just gonna... like... <laughs> and, and if you don't want to have the link for the Google Doc, you can send me any kind of email whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, and then there's some things in the chat. Uh, Jeff Fitzgerald. So I know Ken Jones is going to be presenting later this evening. Yes, re re about the schools and net zero goals of the city. There are HVAC issues that can be coupled with energy efficiency. This is a great pot of money to use. Absolutely. Um, and I can talk about the HVAC specifically. Another pot of funds that came our way that I didn't mention earlier was grant money to Efficiency Vermont, which you may have heard about also from the news. Um, and Andrew LaRosa did a phenomenal job of jumping on that right away. Um, and so our HVAC actually works to the top of its capacity um, right now. So he, because of that grant money, that work was done prior to this school year um, in getting ready for this school year. So. So HVAC is, is in a really good spot right now. We were talking today, um, I'm gonna get the wrong acronym. I don't know if Andrew's on this yet or not, but he can talk about it later. Board members, make sure you ask Andrew later about maybe DDT knobs and switches. Grant, what was it? DDC, digital data control. <laughs> it was a new term for me. Um, digital data controls at, at MHS in particular, which has to do with the heating and the air, the amount of outside air that the system allows into the classrooms. Um, and at our older buildings, actually, we have a pretty good system in place, but we don't have one, surprisingly, at MHS um, that is working as efficiently as we want. So that's another piece that we're looking at that has to do with this type of HVAC kind of issue. Grant, do you want to say anything more about that? No, I think I think you got it. It's um, it's a newer school, but that system is an older one because we've replaced it at other schools, and it is about fresh air and and CO detection and all kinds of good stuff. And we were actually thinking we might use some fund balance, but we could save that and use this money instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good thoughts. Bridget, is your hand up from before, or is it up for another idea? It was up from before, I'll take it down. Okay, just making sure. Other thoughts people want to add into the conversation? Oh, Cassie. <laughs> Cassie. <laughs> it's like money. Yeah, I know, you're an after school person, I know. <laughs> um, can the funds be all, be used for at all for teacher staff bonuses? Jim, are we allowed to announce that? It's a done deal. Um, I don't know if we are, uh, although you, you kind of maybe just I did. know. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, Cassie, we got you covered. <laughs> It can't be used. This money could not, to answer your question, this particular money cannot be used for that purpose. However, we got you covered. <laughs> uh, Tony. You got to unmute yourself, Tony. <laughs> Someday I'll figure it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> my kids are picking on me now. <laughs> um, uh, you were talking about uh, facilities at MSMS, and I'm just wondering if... Um, uh, like the track at the high school is uh, sort of in the mix of ideas. That has been brought up as, yep, that is on our brainstorming documents. Yep, that has been brought up. But again, we're triangulating this data, right? So we want, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a priority for members of a community, then we should put that down, you know, just put it down. It's no harm to put it down twice. Nathan. Um, thank you, Tony, for that nod to the track. That's that's a high on my personal wish list. As uh, we have fifty kids signed up for middle school track right now, and um, we had a bunch of kids staying late beyond the end of track practice because they're having so much fun. Um, my question is to Libby or Grant. Um, I know that we Congress has not come close to passing the infrastructure initiative, but it just, it seems like there's another potential wave uh, that could affect a number of these areas. And um, I just, I would imagine given the strength of our team that you are thinking strategically about, okay, you know, 
given given how we're reading the tea leaves in Washington, maybe this project fits into that, you know, et cetera. Um, so Nathan, were you hanging out by my window of my office around four o'clock today? Because no, okay. Andrew and I were talking about that exact thing yeah. Yeah. Um, earlier today as we were talking about all these projects and we we're like, there's an infrastructure bill that has education funding coming in. So what would be under infrastructure for education? Because Biden, Biden's widening the definition or at least trying to. Um, so we were we were literally talking about that for a good hour today. And then my other follow on to the track uh, facility conversation, and I would broaden that to like outdoor basketball courts and other other things is that I remember when we did the work on the UES playground, I think we realized in the initial stages before we had all the other complications, I think we realized, oh, wait a minute, this is a green space that will be used by many members of the community. Could we collaborate with the city on, on funding this? And I think that from my perspective, watching the number of people who use the track or the tennis courts or things like that at the high school, really thinking carefully that these are really community resources that happen to be located at the high school. Um, and then, you know, if we're far enough ahead of this, I think we have a, a really collaborative city council right now. Um, I don't know if there's a history of working together with that body and thinking collectively about, um, about capital improvements. Thanks. Yeah, it's definitely something. Andrew LaRosa has a very, very strong connection to the um, to the city leaders, um, and we're, in terms of this kind of thing, you know. So he's going to be working, be there at the board meeting tonight with Ken and and all of that kind of stuff. So I know that you know Andrew, being a community member himself, he's very well versed in the people and he knows the people, and and so I think that will be on his. He's our, he's our liaison between the two, but you make a very good point because I can imagine the city of Montpelier will be getting some federal funding as well for projects for the community. Um, and can is there a way to combine, like the tennis courts I'm told were a few years back before my time? Yeah, I, I, and I would argue that just given our location as the state capital, the fact that we have so many state employees here who, you know, sometimes use things after work or during lunch that it's beyond a community resource. Some of these are, you know, region-wide, statewide resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the feeling about like the athletics fields, I see Catherine's putting in the baseball field and we got an email about that tonight, I think from Heidi, um, around the baseball field. Those are also things that we've talked about, absolutely. Um, and, and if we could get our outdoor spaces um, up to par, I'll just put it that way, at the high school, then you also invite, I mean, I hate to put it in this way because it's so great for kids, but it's also a revenue source um, in terms of, con we're right off the highway. We have, a, we have a big parking lot on the weekend, you know, so there, there are other things to consider in that, in that vein as well. Uh, Jill, Jill Remick. Hi everyone, um, just real quick, because this is not my my time to take up, but um, a, a board meeting or two ago, Andrew LaRosa walked the board through and the public through a really helpful document that summarizes all the various facility needs at all four of the school buildings. Some of that stuff might not seem particularly exciting, like windows or roof or drainage, but um, you know, field maintenance, things like that. But that, that list would be really helpful to continue to sort of look at in this context, because you know, um, I love that we're like dreaming big, but I thought, I think he did a really fantastic job of listing objectively the, the you know, the ups and downs of each of the buildings, the recent work that might have already been done that we didn't necessarily know about, and then sort of a wish list of things if we could, or if we had the ability, you know, even just things like windows can have such a significant impact on air quality and heating costs and energy efficiency and wasps at the middle school. <laughs> so uh, I encourage <laughs> folks who, who haven't already to check out that list. Thank you. Yeah, and Jill, you make a good point because one of the things that we're talking about is because there's guidelines and parameters of this federal money, are there things that we've been thinking of doing through our capital fund um, or through fund balance or just through regular maintenance that we could move into ESSER that fit under the health and safety ventilation kind of piece like the windows, which is a huge ticket item, um, which would free up those other monetary sources to do other things that don't have don't necessarily we don't have to go by the guidance to use so those conversations are well in hand and may come out 
as like, you know, the community says, wait, what, they're doing windows? But that would be the reason, because if we can use this federal funding to do things like the windows, which fit under ventilation and safety, then we can have our money that's already budgeted or in our coffers to do other things that don't have to follow the guidance. Um, I see it's 612, but Kara, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Kara. Yeah, I'm going to join the choir on energy issues. Um, I know that our communities feels really strongly about climate change and that any way that we can reduce our energy costs over the long term will leave more money for education over the long term. So if there are pieces of this money that can be put towards health and safety and reducing the energy use of those schools, energy burden, then we can have more money for the long term. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the ability to you know, take some some efficiency improving projects that we had in our capital fund and perhaps you know move those to this and then free up further projects for our capital fund as well. So um, I think there's definitely opportunity to make headway there. Heidi, I see your hand up. You might be at baseball practice right now. I'm here right now with these boys and they actually wanted to talk to you guys for a minute if we can do that. Yeah, I just pulled them out of practice for a sec. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> okay. All right. Can Hi. you say your name? Yeah, sure. All right. So my name is Willem Talbert, and I'm a sophomore at Montpelier High School, and I'm new to the school this year. And uh, I came in through the lottery program. I came from Cabot. Um, it's not really that close to Montpelier. I commute in every day. I came to Montpelier for its academic offerings and social opportunities, and for its sports programs, specifically baseball. Like others on my team, it's one of my favorite things to do, and my goal is to be awarded a scholarship to play for a college or university when I graduate. It's important for me and other members of my team to have the equipment and basic facilities required to play. I hope you'll consider funding the improvements. My family and I value the school so much. I drive each day, sometimes twice a day, to Cabot to Montpelier to get to school and practice. Please help support baseball, not only for me, but for younger kids who might want to play for MHS in the future. Thank you, Will. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Will. And I have one more. Here's Taylor. Hi, uh, my name is Taylor Nunnally. Um, I'm a junior at Montpelier, uh, also on the baseball team, as you guys can tell. Um, yeah, I don't have anything scripted like Will did, but knowing that there's money uh, in, in our possession now of the school district, uh, just the possibility that we could upgrade the field any bit would be amazing. Uh, I know it would make all of us feel like, you know, like we matter uh, to the school. And um, just because, like, right as of right now, like, we don't really have a whole lot of things that other schools have um, as far as the field goes and fencing and all that. Um, and, yeah, it would just it'd be a huge uh, help for our, not only our program now, but it would continue to be prosperous through, for the program throughout the coming years. And I feel like it would really, um, it would encourage younger kids that might be like kind of on the fence about whether or not they want to play in high school. Uh, I feel like it would encourage them to really like, and give them that drive to be like, yeah, I want to play because obviously the school actually cares about us. And uh, it's just, it would make it a better program all around. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for listening. No problem. I love it. I love that you're actually at practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love that these high schoolers felt strongly enough about it that they would do public speaking. Right. So, awesome. You know, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, our baseball players do do that for our, our new scoreboard that's coming at them, too. Absolutely. Um, they're, they're so happy about that. They're so excited. Yeah. I hear it's coming soon. It is. It is. Yeah. Thank you. No, yeah. No, thank you, Heidi. It was great to hear from the students. Thanks. All right. So it's six sixteen, um, and our board members have a meeting right at six thirty, um, and so we had the six fifteen time off, so so board members could go and um, maybe get a bite to eat before the meeting, or inhale a bite to eat. But if you if you're on this call or you have um, friends who want to or friends or com other community members who want to weigh in, feel free to email me. You can email any of the board members. Um, you can, we'll put this Google Doc up live on our website so people can keep adding to the Google Doc. Um, but I, as I get emails around this, I print every one of them out so we, I have a stack so they don't get lost in Google Oblivion. Um, but we're, we're taking all the community feedback we can get right now. So encourage others to just get in touch. 
Um, if they want to have a phone conversation, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, and we'll get this presentation up too, because there are definitely parameters we have to be looking at. Um, it looks like too, Jill just posted the, the Andrew Rosa facility report up there. Thanks, Jill. But yeah, if there's anything in the future, please get in touch, board members. Uh, I think, Anna, this is the same link for the board meeting, right? Is yes, it yes, yes. Yeah. So board members, I think you can just shut off your cameras and your, your mics for a second, go and have some dinner, and I'll see you at 6.30. Please, Libby, Libby, really quick, what what would be like a deadline for the this this phase of community input? Is it like this Friday or oh, next no. Wednesday? No, or... no, we hope to have. Um, you know, we'll be talking about this through through the rest of this month. Um, okay. And we don't have to. It's nine hundred thirty five thousand dollars. My understanding, I could be wrong, but my understanding is is that we don't have to put an application in for all nine hundred thirty five thousand dollars of it. You know, like so we at can, once. Yeah, we can add amendments as it goes. And ideally that's what we'd want to do is we find out more needs as we get the kids back in next year. Right. So um, so yeah, this is this isn't an end, end date process, but we definitely want to have some steps going before the end of this mm -hmm. fiscal year so we can move on on those kind of things. That makes sense. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, thanks everyone.